Hi, everyone. You have to say it back. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so my name is Kamon Felix, and my Z is poetry and language. As a child, I read like seven different books a week. So I guess that really means I read like a book a day, I guess, something along those lines. But the intention behind reading all these books was to escape from the world that I knew. It was to escape from myself. I spent the eight hours of school hiding behind chapter books like as big as the textbooks themselves, 700 pages, 800 pages. I don't know how I got through them. I don't think anyone knows how I got through them. But I spent my whole life from sun up to sundown diving into these books so that I didn't have to deal with what was happening outside of me. In these books, mostly I found people that I trusted because they looked like me, because they had stories that were similar to me, because they sounded like me, because we spoke the same language. They were complex and they were silenced. There was a mother dead here, a father gone there, a brother in prison, a brother dead, a home broken, a block lost. These stories filled up in me and spilled out of me because I hadn't the language to explain them, to talk about them the way that I talk about them now. There was something inherently wrong with the fact that all of these stories and the women in these stories looked like me. When I started to come out of my books and look around me, I could see the stories in the people who were around me. So I saw the stories in my mother, in my grandmother, in my cousins, in my father, the people in my building, the people on my block, the people in my neighborhood. My circle got larger and larger as I came out of the books. But the only reason why I had paid any attention or started to pay any attention to what was outside of me was because the stories that were in the book related to me in the first place. I was self-destructive when I was younger. I was a rebel. I was a cutter. I was severely depressed. There was no one who could take me out of the depression that I drove myself into. I got there because the books that I read, the stories that I read, I understood them, but there was no one to talk to about them. In school, we talked about the things that we all talk about in elementary school or junior high school. We talk about math, we talk about the Civil War, we talk about the Civil Rights Movement. And the way that we talk about things are so distant, it's not in relation to us at all. We never say, this happened to you, and this is why I'm teaching you about it. We learn about things that don't relate to us or don't matter to us until 20 years later, 30 years later, later or maybe never. So I'm gonna share some of those stories with you. When a little girl says that a man's hands have been where they should not have and nobody moves, expect flames. Send notice to the hurricanes, tell them to hang the halos from their pockets. There will be no preservation of innocence, not today, today. Ashley Jones sits in the corner of her prison cell with a Mickey Mouse mascot and some silence to share the secrets with. She cannot see the way her feet twitch in the dark, so she imagines them running across pavement or minefield, but running like she's always had to, but running like she's really going to get somewhere. This time, she's 14 and will spend the rest of her life in solitary confinement where she will chew her fingers, converse with the bricks, and contemplate shoving herself between them at five. Her stepfather held her down beneath the quilt and told her a little girls are meant to be open windows, and that if he wanted to, he could shove himself inside of her and then shove her out of one at eight. Her mother left her in the middle of a crack house by accident at nine. They both bullied her into eating dinner at gunpoint. At 10, she stabbed them both. The government sent her and her little sister to live with grandparents who bathed their home in ammonia and could not stand any hands that might stain the paint. At 14, she stabbed, shot, and set fire to everyone she lived with, her grandmother, her grandfather, her little sister, this pattern is trying to snatch the symphony from our bones. It wants us to listen to the stories that should scare the protests into us. Hear this. She's a baby, singing her hands into slave songs where freedom means forgetting to be afraid of blood and terror. It means turning herself into horror movie protagonists. Hear this. There is hope in revenge, in being shoved face down, hands bound to back or remembering the pistol she hit you with. The judge says, between the ages of two and three, you develop a conscience. Ashley Jones never got the voice that said, this is bad, Ashley. Ashley says, everyone I loved, 
everyone I trusted. The judge says, Ashley Jones is no candidate for the argument that life without parole is too long. Ashley says, they betrayed me. Ashley says, they betrayed me. Ashley said, you betray me. When a little girl says that a man's hands have been where they should not have and nobody moves, expect the flames. Expect to watch it curdle in her chest like a tectonic stimulus. Expect to watch her spit it at you. Ashley says, they betrayed me. This apology is nine years too late. But we want you to know that we are so sorry for watching your childhood die and then burying it with the monsters we made out of you. <laughs> Ashley's story, while it stands alone, is a facet of so many stories that get stuck at the bottom of the barrel. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, one in three black men can expect to go to prison in their lifetime. So that's 10 boys in an average third grade class. That's 10 of you sitting here right now if you're men of color. This room is pretty small, but there are about 100 people who can fit into it, and at least 50 of those men are going to prison. The prison industrial complex has commodified people of color, making them pawns in a grand scheme that leaves the families of these men in shambles. When the men come home from prison, after being branded with a federal charge, they are unable to find work and unable to provide for their families, thus perpetuating the pervasive nature of helplessness that interrupts the entire family dynamic. Helplessness leads to anger. When the men come home, the women suffer the greatest. These are the cyclical stories that go untold and die in our mouths because we don't tell them, because we don't know how to. So now I'm going to tell a part of my story. If you've been waiting for the day that you'll be dressed for truth, it'll be the day of your rape kit, when they will lock the balls of your feet into clamps that hold like labor. They'll ask you questions about your cycles, want to know if you urinate before or after you inhale, want to know how many ways you've ever been invisible ink before they can believe you. And then they'll lock the results into a chart, stare at you like you are a brand new resurrection of smiles, the OBGYN will whisper, I am glad that I am not your mother. And you will think that she is lucky to have woken up in her skin that morning. The first morning, the first bath, the first breakfast is always the recounting of your portions. You will check to see where the patterns have burned, where he tagged himself to the blue of your trauma, and everyone will talk at you instead of with you with words like victim and survivor whimpering out of pharmacy bottles of brandy and vodka, and instantly you will know. They have no right to call you survivor until you feel like it. Eventually, you will tell them that being raped is like global annihilation inside of one body, like losing God in the middle of a blizzard like knowing where your pulse is, but walking right by it. Back roads aren't back roads anymore. They're movie scenes for girls with footsteps like swollen dialogue, and everyone wants to talk to you. Everyone wants you to know that they are so sorry without actually knowing what they are sorry for, and you would almost be grateful for them if you could walk, but in the bathroom, your blood is still lining the tub. At the police station, your favorite bra is infused with the smell of man and winter, and it's in your hair, and you can't get it out. And in the kitchen, your mother is cooking so much like she wants to compress the morning into your stomach. And in the bedroom, you are still circling the parts of you where his teeth, his smell of man, his hands like a gardener's hasn't been. And you will think, what kind of woman am I now with my insides like a shipwreck? What kind of woman am I now with my laundry yawning and dirty like he carved something burlesque into the failure of my fist? What kind of mother will I be when my daughter asks if I love the man who stole the balance from me? What kind of lover will I be? My body a thesaurus of sin. And then two weeks later, maybe two months, maybe two years, the mirror will be a reminder of everything you've still got left to fight with. Broken will just be a memory for restoration. You will teach yourself to breathe until apocalypse is right below your fingertips. And then you'll be queen and God and survivor all at the same time. So that was my story. In this room right now, there is someone sitting next to you, across from you, 
behind you who knows this story as well as I do. For a long time, I didn't have the language to define what happened to me. But growing up, writers like Maya Angelou, Alice Walker, Gwendolyn Books offered me a perspective of reflection. The only reason I can stand before you right now with such assurance is because other writers gave me a mirror. I do this because I want to be a mirror, because I believe that every story is a mirror. There is no equation for oppression. Even with the keys in the locks and the truth lined up right in front of us, oppression will never make sense. What we do have are our stories, the way they make us feel, how we make others feel. And the only thing that makes sense at this point is the rawness of humanity. My story, your story, and the collective story of us is what answers the questions. My name is Kamon Felix, and my Z reclaims the narrative. Thank you.